another two interesting ceramic finds. The first is the base of a post-medieval redware vessel. Um, you can see it's been glazed inside uh, and the clay is red. Um, difficult to date these items. Uh, Post-medieval redware was produced in huge quantities right through from the Tudor period in the 16th century um, into the Victorian period and even beyond for utilitarian wares. Um, mainly industrial and utilitarian wares for the household kitchen and dairy, uh, that sort of thing. Um, this base is surprisingly thick, so um, rather crudely made. So I'd put it earlier in the period, maybe 16th or 17th centuries. Um, it's either got a very large pot, um, it's the base of a very large pot, which has now, obviously the rest of it has disappeared, uh, and it would be thick for that reason. Or possibly it's made very thick for an industrial purpose, because it held something which was volatile or heavy. Um, it's difficult to be sure, but it is surprisingly uh, thick for its size. The second item is a floor tile. Uh, and we can see that it has some mortar left from where it was bedded onto a floor surface. Uh, red clay floor tiles are made in quantity, both in this country and imported from the continent, especially from Holland, uh, throughout the medieval and post-medieval periods. Uh, generally, the medieval ones tend to be smaller, um, so I imagine this is probably post-medieval floor tile. Again, um, same sort of period, maybe 16th, 17th, maybe early, even early 18th century. The second item that we see on this video is a little later. It's um, the base of a slop bowl and it's made from bone china, refined earthenware. Now in the Georgian period, that is the late 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, a slop bowl was a standard part of your tea set. So it would come with your teapot and your cups and saucers um, and it would be used just to collect the dregs and the small bits of tea and leaves that um, had not been uh, drunk at the end of your tea making ceremony and you just use these to collect these and take them away. These items are viral bone marrow jars, uh, no expert um, knowledge needed to identify these. They were first produced around 1899 and these jars date um, from pretty close to that period, in the Edwardian period I would imagine. Um, they're both transfer printed um, but interesting they're, they're made in different batches or by different manufacturers. Uh, one is glazed underneath and one has two little identification marks to the underneath. Um, and this would have been in standard practice by manufacturers who are producing a lot of foodstuffs um, that they would get batches of jars in from different people around the country.
The next items are a lovely collection of mainly ink bottles but also um, stoneware, salt glazed stoneware bottles used for holding liquids. Uh, all of these date to the late to mid Victorian period. Um, most of them for inks, um, for buying quantities of ink very cheaply. Um, the small squat ones are called penny inks because they were apparently sold for a penny which gives you an idea of the vast numbers that were made in the Victorian period. Um, the last item is a much more higher status thing of a glass crystal cut inkwell with the remains of its brass lid and that would have graced the desk um, of a more well-to-do person than a simple stoneware ink. These last items are some of the most easily identifiable and iconic foreshore finds, um, being Bartman bottles. Now these stoneware bottles um, are made in salt glazed stoneware, that is salt was thrown into the kiln um, at the end of the manufacturing process and it produces this lovely speckled glaze, sometimes called a tiger glaze. And millions of these stoneware bottles were imported um, from the Rhineland um, in the 16th and 17th centuries. They were made uh, in the 16th century at Cologne and Aachen, and then after that um, at a place called Frechen. Uh, and they were very, very um, popular all around Europe and exported uh, well, anywhere that Europeans went across the globe as well, really. Um, very recognisable from the bearded face, which is found on the um, top of the bottle, around the rim, the bottle neck. Um, the form of these bottles was very globular, so below the neck they, they bulged out. And on the belly of the bottle would be um, a rosette or a crest, and on larger bottles maybe three crests around the bottle um, and these crests would bear the marks of merchants or towns and cities uh, and even aristocracy, aristocracy and royalty. Um, anyone could order these bottles and have their own crest put on them and they also made bottles with standard um, flower rosettes or um, fantasy crests which weren't for particular individuals or they used the moulds. They used the moulds to make the rosettes and the faces. Um, and they just do a combination of moulds on some bottles so you can get the crest of uh, French and the, the city uh, crest of um, Amsterdam, for example, on the same bottle.
Um, generally, the faces were much more realistic and better modelled on the earlier bottles, so it's the 16th century. And by the time um, the 17th century progressed, there was a mass production and the faces become more crude and um, frankly, some of them are quite scary. Um, but they're wonderful finds to make on the foreshore. They used to be called um, bellamines. Um, this came from the fact that it was thought that they were making fun of the Roman Catholic Cardinal Bellamine. Um, but at his, as he was only a boy, when uh, the first faces were produced on these bottles. Um, it's probably unlikely that he was the source of the decoration. Um, it's more likely that it was just a representative of a happy drinker or a standard drinker, a bit like um, Toby Juggs are more recently.